Section 18 of Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. Section 18. The Atom Smasher by Victor Rousseau. Chapters 5 and 6. Chapter 5. The Eye of Atlantis For perhaps half an hour the three lay there, hearing nothing. It seemed to be night, for the darkness was impenetrable, save for the lurid flashes of fire from the volcano. Parrish, who was slowly recovering his strength, was mumbling incessantly. It was with difficulty that Jim recalled him to a realization of his surroundings. "'Where is the city of Atlantis?' he asked him. Over there, mumbled Parrish, behind the volcano. Why do you ask me? I'm thinking of going there. Eh? Going there? You're mad. The eye will see you, the eye that can see for a hundred miles. They'll turn the ray on you. Nothing is too small for the eye, and they watch night and day. The eye is off now. It's never off. The eye is dark. It grows white only when they are about to use the ray. Perhaps the eye is watching us now. Nevertheless, said Jim, I think we would do well to try to enter the city. We can't live here in the jungle at the mercy of these Drilgos. It is impossible to enter. All strangers are killed by the Atlanteans. Dad, interposed Lucille, I think we'd better do what Jim suggests. One of us must decide. My idea is that you take us to some place where we can get a view of the city, said Jim. Then we can make up our minds what to do. We've got to get somewhere out of this jungle. Parrish rose to his feet, mumbling. If we go round the base of the volcano, we can see Atlantis, he said. It's always light there. In the daytime they drive away the fogs by some means they've got, and at night they have an artificial sun. But we'll be killed. We'll all be killed. Mumbling and muttering, he began groping his way through the undergrowth in the direction of the volcano, whose flashes were again becoming more frequent, affording a means of directing their route. Obscure rumblings were again beginning to shake the earth. For an hour the three picked their way steadily upward through the ferns, until the ground became more open. They were approaching the base of the volcano, whose side now towered above them, the upper part glassy with vitreous lava. Suddenly Parrish, who was still leading, stopped and began to tremble with fear. Stepping to his side, Jim heard the low muttering of voices not far away. Very cautiously he moved forward through the thin fern scrub, until the glow of burning embers caught his sight. He stopped, hearing the voices more distinctly, and again moved forward. Three Drilgos, huge, bestial men, and evidently an outpost, were squatting around the ashes, devouring something with noisy gusto. Softly as Jim had moved, their acute ears had caught the sound of his footsteps. They rose, still holding what they were eating in their hands, and, grasping their stone spears, moved in three separate ways toward the edge of the clearing. The man nearest Jim uttered a guttural exclamation and, after sniffing a moment, began to lope in his direction. Suddenly he stopped short, petrified with astonishment and fear at the sight of a man who, instinct told him, was neither Atlantean nor of his own kind. Jim leaped, tackling him about the knees, and brought him heavily to the ground. As the Drilgo fell, the spear clattered from his hand, but from his snakeskin girdle he pulled a long, curved knife of chipped obsidian, sharp as a razor. Jim grasped the Drilgo's wrist, but in a moment he saw that he was no match for the creature in strength. He drew back his right arm and delivered a punch to the solar plexus with all his strength. As the Drilgo's hand grew limp, he snatched away the knife. There was no helping what he did, for the two others were close upon him. A thrust, a slashing blow, and the Drilgo was weltering in his lifeblood. A backward leap, and Jim evaded the flung spear by a hair's breadth. Knife in hand, he leaped forward and, dodging in beneath the long shaft of the weapon, got in a slash that almost cut the Drilgo's body in two. The third Drilgo, 
seeing his two companions in their death throes, flung away his spear and fled with loud howls into the jungle. Jim stepped back. Lucille and her father were already almost at his heels. It's all right, he called. Come this way. He led them through the ferny growth in such a manner that they should not see the two dead bodies. Nevertheless, he felt that Lucille knew. Let's see what they were cooking, he said. But again, he turned quickly. He could not know for sure what flesh that was, roasting and scorching on the embers, and he had no desire to know. It might have been monkey, but... He turned away, and as he did so, Parrish picked up several round objects that were lying a little distance away. These are good to eat, he said. A sort of breadfruit. I've lived on it for five years, he added, with a sort of grotesque pathos. They munched the fruit as they proceeded up the mountain, and found it satisfying. Parrish seemed more himself again, though he still muttered at intervals. Lucille clung closely to Jim as they proceeded. They were treading on lava now, vitreous and smooth as glass. It was impossible to proceed further in that direction. They turned their steps around the base in the direction of the sea. After another hour, during which their way was lit by almost continuous lurid flashes from the crater, a patch of illumination, apparently out at sea, began to become visible. A half hour more, and they were rounding the volcano's base, and suddenly it burst upon them, a stupendous spectacle that drew an exclamation of amazement from Jim's lips. That low, flat background was the sea, the sound of whose breakers was faintly audible. Between sea and land ran a narrow, slender causeway, perhaps a mile in length, and beyond that, set on a small island, was the most splendid city that Jim could have imagined. Like New York, very like New York, with its mighty towers, but more symmetrical, sloping upward from the sea toward a towering rampart at the heart of it, crowned with huge domes and minarets and serpentine ramps and mighty blocks of stone that must have sheltered as many occupants as New York's highest skyscrapers. The whole was snow-white and gleamed softly in an artificial light dispensed from an enormous artificial planet that seemed to hover above the ramparts. God, whispered Jim in awe as he gazed at the great city. You cannot cross that causeway, whimpered old Parrish. It's death to try. One sweep of the ray will blot out every living thing. Hush, listen, came from Lucille's lips. Something's moving down there. The distant murmur of voices, the indescribable feel of the proximity of other human beings, told Jim that they were in imminent danger. He glanced about him. A little overhead was an outcrop of enormous boulders, standing up like a little fortress above the smooth lava. "'Get behind there!' Jim whispered. They turned and ran, slipping and stumbling up the smooth slope. Reaching the boulders, they ensconced themselves hastily behind them. Jim peered out through a crevice between two of the largest stones. The sound of moving things became more audible. Then, as a flash of flame shot from the crater overhead, Jim saw a black human horde creeping like an array of ants around the base of the mountain not far beneath. Just like an army of warrior ants it seemed to flow onward, in perfect order, and in the midst of it a faint violet light began to be visible. Parrish seized Jim's arm, shaking with terror. "'You know what that is, Dent?' he whimpered. "'It's Toda's Drilgos, moving for a night attack upon Atlantis,' answered Jim." and that thing in the middle is the Atom Smasher. It seemed hours before the last of the serried ranks of Drilgos had passed. By the light of a lurid flash from the volcano, Jim could see the column winding toward the causeway. Then all was shrouded in impenetrable darkness, save for the snow-soft city upon the island. "'What are we going to do?' chattered old Parrish. "'I wish I was back in Tota's cave. He gave me food and let me help with his work sometimes.' I'll die here. We'll never get away. We'll never get anywhere. We're safer here than anywhere else, answered Jim. We'll have to stay till morning, or... God, look at that! Out of the ramparts of the city, the round, blue-white disk of the eye had suddenly disclosed itself, and simultaneously a violet flare shot up above the moving hosts of the Drilgos in the middle of the causeway. Out of the center of the eye that blinding searchlight streamed, 
and the pillar of violet fire rose up to counter it, clove it in two, as a man cuts off the tentacle of a cuttlefish, and left it groping helplessly above the heads of the Drilgos. To and fro wavered the blue-white beam, and like a protective wall, the violet column spread and extended, till the air was interlaced with the play of the two colors. Streaks of white shot through streaks of purple, and black neutral clouds twirled, swirling in ghost-like forms. It was a scene inconceivably beautiful, and it was impossible to realize what must be happening out there. Men must be dying, withering like stubble in the blue-white flames, whenever they caught them. And yet, under that play of colors, Jim could see the vast host crawling forward to the assault. He held his breath. It was sublime and terrible, and on the result of that conflict depended... What? What difference, when all this was forgotten history, antedating the written records of the human race? Then, of a sudden, the blue-white rays were seen to win. They were beating down the violet light. Like living fingers, they pierced that protective wall, flinging it back until only the tall central pillar remained. And then, for the first time, the sound of combat became audible. A groan of despair, of defeat, of hopelessness. The black stream was recoiling, turning upon itself. In the vivid glare of the white light, it could be seen dissolving, breaking into a thousand pieces, streaming back toward the land. And, as it broke, the blue-white light pursued, eating its way and blasting all it met. Atlantis had triumphed. Another sound was audible. From the city it came, a whirring as of innumerable grasshoppers, increasing till it sounded once more like the tapping of innumerable woodpeckers. Suddenly, the night broke into whirling balls of fire. Lucille cried out. Jim leaped to his feet to see more clearly. It's men with wings, he cried. Scores of them. They're hurling something at the Drilgos. The clacking of the wing mechanism filled the air. Now the fugitives from the Drilgo host were streaming along the base of the mountain underneath seeking the safety of the jungles, and over them, riding them, harrying them, flew the Atlantean birdmen, hurling their fiery balls. And where the balls fell, conflagrations of cold fire seemed to start and run like mercury, and shrivel up everything they touched. But the birdmen were not without casualties of their own. Here and there one could be seen to drop, and then the massed drilgos would turn savagely upon him with their stone-pointed spears. The fight was coming very close now. The savage cries of the Drilgos filled the night. A ball of fire broke hardly fifty yards away from where the three were crouching. A birdman fluttered down like a wounded hawk and lay a sprawl just underneath the rampart of boulders. Jim surmounted them, ran down the slope of the mountainside, and bent over the dying man. He was hideously wounded by the thrust of a Drilgo spear. Whether because the mechanism had failed or because he had swooped too low, Jim could not determine. As Jim bent over him, he looked up at him. A youth in his teens, with the face and build of a Greek warrior, a worthy ancestor of European man. Jim looked at him and shuddered. My grandfather four hundred generations removed, he thought. Seeing that this was no Drilgo, with eyes widened by the anticipation of death, the Atlantean smiled and died. Jim detached the straps that held the wings to his shoulders and examined them. They were multi-hinged, built of innumerable layers of laminated wood, which seemed to have been subjected to some special treatment. In the base of each, just where it fitted to the curve of the shoulder blade, a tiny light was burning. Jim looped the straps about his arms and walked back to the rampart. Old Parrish saw him and screamed. Lucille cried out. I'm going to try to get the Atom Smasher, said Jim, pointing to the thin spire of violet flame that was still visible in the center of the causeway. It's our only chance. You must stay here. If I live, I'll return. If I don't return... But he knew that he must return. Nothing could kill him, because Lucille would be waiting for him behind that rampart of stones upon the bare, vitreous mountainside. I'm going to get the Atom Smasher, Jim repeated. In these wings I'll be taken for Atlantean. I'll bring it back. He spoke with faltering conviction. 
and yet there was nothing else to do. Everything depended upon his being able to bring back the Atom Smasher and take Lucille and her father away. I think you're right, Jim, answered Lucille. We'll wait here till you come back. Her voice died away in a sob. Jim bent and kissed her. Then he began examining the mechanism of the wings. It did not appear difficult. A leather strap fastened around the body. Through this strap ran cords operated by levers upon the breast, and there was a knob in a groove that looked as if it controlled the starting of the mechanism. "'I'll be back,' said Jim. And suddenly the eye appeared again, and with it there sounded once more the whir of wings. "'Down!' shouted Jim. He was too late. A score of birdmen shot out of the dark and hovered over them. Next moment they had descended to the ground. Lucille and Parrish were seized, and Jim, struggling furiously, quickly found himself equally helpless in their grasp. The accents of the Atlanteans, as they spoke to one another, were soft and liquid. Their faces were refined and gentle, but their strength was that of athletes. Jim saw Lucille and Parrish lifted into the air. Next moment he himself was raised in the arms of one of the birdmen, who shot upward like an arrow and headed a course back toward the city, carrying Jim as if he had been as light as a child. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 Human Sacrifice In a great open space, flanked by temples and colonnades, the flight had come to rest. There, under the soft artificial light that made the whole city as bright as day, Jim, Lucille, and her father were set down before a sort of rostrum, on which were gathered the dignitaries of the city. Jim's hopes were rising fast, for between the Atlanteans and the savage Drilgos there was as much difference as between a modern American and a black fellow from the Australian bush. These men were civilized to a degree that even modern America has not attained. Nowhere was there a speck of dirt to be seen. Vehicles moved soundlessly along the wide streets on either side of this central meeting place, and the whole city was roofed with glass, through which could be seen the brilliant moon and stars, invisible from the mist-filled valley without. Soft garments of white wool clothed men and women alike, fashioned something like togas, but cut short at the knee, leaving the lower part of the leg bare and disclosing the sandaled feet. The hair was long and flowed about the shoulders, but what struck Jim most forcibly was the look of utter gentleness and benignity upon these faces. I guess we've fallen into pretty good hands after all, he whispered to Parrish. But one of the dignitaries upon the platform, an elderly man with a face reminiscent of William Jennings Bryan in his inspired moments, was leaning forward out of his curved chair and addressing the old man, and, to Jim's astonishment, Parrish was answering. But these were not the liquid accents of the Atlanteans. The words resembled the barking of a dog, and across Jim's brain there suddenly flashed the explanation. The dignitary was speaking in the tongue of the Drilgos, which Parrish, of course, would have learned in his five years of captivity. Suddenly Parrish turned to Jim. He wants to know where we come from, he said. I've told him from a far country. He thinks we're ambassadors from some of the parts of Europe that the Atlanteans who sailed away some years ago landed at. It's no use trying to explain. They don't seem to have succeeded in inventing an atom smasher for themselves. Jim nodded, and the colloquy went on and on, while the Atlanteans listened with languid interest, their kind and smiling faces seeming to exude benignity. At length the session seemed to have ended. Parrish wore a wide grin. "'Everything's coming right, dear,' he told Lucille. "'The old chap says we are to be the guests of the city, either for a night or for a week. It's something to do with the moon, and there seems to be a full moon tonight.' some quaint superstition or other, and then I guess we'll have a chance to get away in the Atom Smasher. I've learned something of the mechanism, and it won't be hard to operate it. We've fallen into good hands. A squad of four soldiers or policemen, with shorter robes and what looked like truncheons in their hands, made signs to the three to accompany them. Amid mutual bows, the city's guests filed into a small courtway, closed at the further end, on which a number of Atlanteans were standing. While Jim was wondering what the next move was to be, 
To his astonishment, the whole courtyard began to rise slowly up the walls of the tall buildings on either side. "'An elevator!' gasped Lucille. "'Now I do feel that everything is coming out all right, Jim, dear.' Jim did not question the psychology of this. He pressed her hand tenderly. Already Tota and the past were becoming a bad dream. "'Did you say anything about the Atom Smasher, Parrish?' he asked. "'No, I thought it better not to,' replied the old scientist. "'You see, they know it only as a force that neutralizes the blue-white ray. Best not to let them know we're sailing for home in it.' "'I think that was wise,' answered Jim. And just then the rising courtway came to a stop level with the top story of the great building at one side. Smiling courteously, the guards invited the three to precede them inside an enormous hall, supported on pillars of gleaming stone resembling alabaster. In the center was a small, low table, triangular in shape, with three of the low, curved chairs. The guards invited the three to be seated. Almost immediately, smiling servitors brought in fruits on platters of porcelain, dishes of cooked vegetables, somewhat like the modern ones, but seasoned and flavored with delicious herbs. The staple dish was something like an oval banana, but infinitely more succulent. The three fell to and made a hearty meal, which was washed down with fine wines. "'We've certainly fallen into good hands,' said Jim. "'All we've got to do is to lie low and look pleasant, and it won't be long before we get an opportunity to get hold of the Atom Smasher.' The guards, seeing that they had finished their meal, smilingly invited them to accompany them through a huge bronze door at one end of the hall. It swung back, disclosing complete darkness. Jim felt Lucille's hand upon his arm. The girl was hesitating, and for a moment Jim hesitated too, half afraid of a fall into emptiness. Then he heard the footsteps of the guards ahead, and went on. It was eerie, moving there with the sound of feet in front of them, and, apart from that, utter silence. Then Lucille uttered a little cry. "'Jim, do you feel something pushing you?' she asked. "'There is something.' Jim swung around, but some invisible force continued to propel him forward. He moved sidewise, and the force gently corrected him. The sound of footsteps had ceased. "'What is it, Jim?' cried the girl. "'Help me. Something's got hold of me.' Old Parrish was struggling close beside them. Jim panted as he wrestled with the force, but his efforts were absolutely futile. Slowly, as if slid on wires, he was propelled forward, until a cushion of air seemed to block his further progress. Dark as it was, and silent, Jim had the consciousness of other human beings about him, of a vast, unseen multitude that was watching him. Suddenly the droning of a chant began to fill the place, as if a priest were intoning hymns. As that chant rose and fell, voices all about took up the echoing refrain. Jim tried to reach Lucille, but he could move his arm only a few inches against that resilient force pressing in on all sides of him. Then, in an instant, a blinding, stabbing light shot through his eyeballs. He heard Lucille scream, Old Parrish yelp, and, with eyelids screwed tight against the intolerable glare, fought once more desperately and ineffectively to reach Lucille's side. Slowly, Jim managed to unscrew his eyes. He began to realize that he was standing in what appeared to be an enormous amphitheater, but high up, upon a narrow tongue of flooring that ran like a bridge from one end to the other, with Lucille on his right and Parrish on his left. Nothing visible seemed to be restraining them, and yet they were as securely held as if fastened with tight chains. Jim's brain reeled as he looked down. Imagine a bridge about halfway up an amphitheater of a hundred stories, the ground beneath packed with human beings no larger than ants, the whole of the vast interior lined with them, tier above tier, faces and forms increasing from pismire size below to the dimensions of the human form upon a level, and again, fading almost to pinpoints at the summit of the vast building, where the soft glow of the artificial light filtered through the glass of the roof. He clutched at the air, felt the soft pressure of the force that was restraining him, looked at Lucille, and saw her half unconscious with fear, leaning against it, leaning against that soft, resilient, cushion-like, invisible substance, looked at Parrish, whom the shock had thrown into a sort of semi-catalepsy. Parrish, mouthing and staring, 
he looked forward to where the tongue of flooring ended. Here, upon a stage, flanked with huge carven figures, a group was gathered. At first he was unable to discern what was being enacted there, so brilliant was the light that glared overhead. It was the eye, a round disk perhaps ten feet in diameter, that all-seeing eye of Atlantis that guarded the great city. But how it worked Jim was totally unable to discover. He saw, however, that it was blinking rapidly, the alternations being so swift that it was only just possible to be conscious of them. Perhaps the eye was opening and closing ten times a second. Jim strained his eyes to see what was taking place on the stage at the end of the tongue on which he stood. What was it? What were they doing there? And was that the captured Atom Smasher standing between what looked like grinning idols? A group of captured Drilgos near it? A shrill scream from Lucille echoed through the vast amphitheater. Her eye had seen what Jim's had not yet seen, something that had shocked her into complete unconsciousness. A marble figure, she stood leaning against the invisible force that kept her on her feet, and in those open, staring eyes was a look of ineffable horror. Jim could see clearly now, for the light from the eye was slowly diminishing in brilliancy, or else his own eyes were growing more accustomed to it. Those carven figures, forming a semicircle upon the platform, were figures of gods, squat, huge forms seeming to emerge out of the blocks of rock from which they had been fashioned. Hideous, gruesome carvings they were, resembling some futuristic sculpture of today, for the artist who had fashioned them had given hardly more than a hint of the finished representation. It was rather as if the masses of rock that had been transported there had become vitalized, foreshadowing the dim yet awful beings that were some day to emerge from them. Only the arms were clearly sculpted, and each of the half-dozen figures squatting upon its haunches in that semicircle had four of them, arms that protruded so as to form an interlacing network, and the fingers were long claws fashioned of some metal. Over the arms the shapeless heads beat down with a leering look, and from each mouth protruded a curved tongue. A masterpiece of horror, that group, like the great stone figures of the Aztecs, or some of the hideous Indian gods. Seen under the glare of the eye, they formed a background of horrible omen. In a flash, it dawned upon Jim that these hideous figures might be gods of bloody sacrifice. That's why these people seem so gentle, he heard himself saying. It's the... the contrast. He pulled himself together. Again he tried to move towards Lucille, and again that invisible force restrained him. Yes, it was the captured Atom Smasher upon the platform, and those forms grouped in front of the dignitaries were captured Drilgos, a dozen or so of them and the concealed priest was droning a chant again. Every other sound was hushed, but from each square foot of the great amphitheater a pair of eyes was watching. A myriad of eyes turned upon the platform. What was going to happen next? Suddenly the priest's voice died away, and simultaneously the three dignitaries, who seemed to be officiating priests from their solemn gestures, stepped backward, passing beneath the protruding arms of the idols. There sounded the deep whir of some mechanism somewhere, and the same invisible force that had Jim and his two companions in its control suddenly began to agitate the captive Drilgos. It was shuffling them. It was forcing them into line, pushing here and pulling there, in spite of the Drilgos' terrified struggles. They writhed and twisted, groaning and clicking in abject terror as they wrestled with that unseen power, and all in vain. Slowly the foremost of the Drilgos was propelled forward, inch by inch, until he stood immediately beneath the interlacing arms. And what happened next filled Jim with sick horror and loathing. For of a sudden the arms began to move, the iron claws cut through the air, a shriek of terror and anguish broke from the Drilgos' mouth, and he was no longer a man, but a clawed and pulped mass of human flesh. Aya! 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 broke from the throats of the assembled multitude. The weaving arms had stopped. From behind them, an attendant was gathering up what had been the Drilgo in a basket. Then the mechanism had begun again, and again that shrill cry of the spectators was ringing in Jim's ears. Louder still rose the shriek of old Parrish as he understood. Jim put forth all his strength in a mad effort to break free. 
a child would have had more chance in the grip of a giant. And each time the arms of the gods revolved, the unseen force pushed Jim, Lucille, and Parrish nearer the platform. Now Jim understood. This horrible sacrifice was a part of the religion of the Atlanteans, and he, Lucille, and Parrish were being reserved for the final spectacle. And at the sight of Lucille beside him, stonily unconscious and yet standing, and moving like a mechanical doll in little forward jerks, at the sight of the girl, hardly six feet distant, and yet utterly beyond the touch of his fingertips, Jim went mad. He would not shout. He closed his lips in pride of race, pride of that civilization that he had left twelve thousand years ahead of him. Not like the shrieking Drilgos on the platform, howling as each of them in turn was forced into that maze of revolving knives. But he fought as a madman fights. He hammered at the resilient air, while the sweat ran down his face. He braced his feet upon the wooden tongue, and sought to stay his forward progress. And all the while that infernal force moved him steadily onward. He was on the platform now. He was traveling the same route that the Drilgos had taken. The unseen force was shuffling him, Lucille, and Parrish, pushing and pulling them. And, despite Jim's efforts, it was Lucille who was first of the three, and Jim second, and old Parrish third. Jim heard Parrish's hoarse whisper behind him. Death! Death! The uranium! He was fumbling at his breast, but the significance of the words and gestures escaped him. He was staring ahead. Only three living Drilgos of the whole number of prisoners remained alive, and suddenly it was borne in upon Jim that he knew the last of the three. It was the Drilgo, Cain, who had been their companion in the Atom Smasher. There, not a dozen feet distant. Cain, his bestial face, with the ridged eyebrows and great jaws, convulsed with terror and dripping sweat. Cain, immediately in front of Lucille. God, let her not wake. Let her never know, Jim breathed. The agony would be but momentary. And there was nothing a man could not endure if he must. He could even endure to see Lucille become what the Drilgos had become. It would soon be over now. The eye was blinking overhead. The hideous stone faces of the Atlantean gods looked down in leering mockery. Another of the Drilgos had gone the same route as the others. Cain was the second now, Lucille the third victim, and he, Jim, would be the fourth. Gritting his teeth, Jim saw the next Drilgo propelled forward into the whirling knives. He saw the man fling up his arms as if to shield his head, and then he was a man no longer, and the horrible knives revolved, and, Ah! 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 cried the multitude. Once more the mechanism whirred, once more the arms revolved. A howl of terror broke from Cain's lips as he was propelled onward. Then suddenly the whirring stopped. The arms of the stone gods, with their hooked, razor-like claws, to which clung particles of flesh, were arrested in midair. Cain, unharmed, was leaning backward, his features set in a mask of awful fear. Simultaneously Jim knew that the force which had held him in thrall was gone. He flung his arms out. He was free. He grasped Lucille, held her tightly against his breast, stood there drawing great labored breaths, waiting. For what? A film was creeping over his eyes, but he was aware that the eye had suddenly gone out, and out of the dark the priest was chanting. Then came a deep-drawn sigh from the spectators, followed by a ringing shout. In place of the eye, the full moon appeared sailing overhead and holding off that deathly weakness, Jim understood. The sacrifice had ended. A new month had begun. End of chapter 6 Reading by Allison Stewart, Concord, California